We're super excited today. Melba Giles and Trey and Cruz both agreed to spend some time with us while the is on this bag. Um, and I'm just going to introduce them very briefly, um, partly because our we're going to focus with the youth, right? Um, our relationship has come out of Melvin Giles and Diane Dodge have been facilitating a reconciliation lunch break that I've mentioned to this class and we've invited you to a couple of times for the last 10 or 15 years. And Turn and I and Olivia all met in the context of the last few months of reconciliation lunch groups. And Melvin recently was the recipient of the Beloved Community Award from Hamlin part of our Black History Month and MFA celebration for largely for his work as a peacemaker and for being someone who's mentored Hamlin students, especially in urban agriculture and peacemaking efforts in the neighborhoods now. Karen, as I understand it, has been a really important leader of the Black Lives Matter chapter in Minnesota and of the politics that have led us up to having a reparations program is actually launching and that we can learn how to support. So I'm looking forward to learning more. Thank you so much for visiting us today. <laughs> really, however you'd like to start, if you have any kind of background that you wanted to share, you have to Cruz, I'm the co-founder of BLM Minnesota and the lead organizer. I'm also the uh, co-convener of the St. Paul Recovery Act Reparations Commission. St. Paul is one of the biggest cities in America that passed a reparations resolution. Um, on January 13, 2021, St. Paul passed resolution 2177 that apologized for Holy Press Top Military Slavery at Fort Stilling, apologized for the destruction of the Rama community in the I-94 freeway, apologized for St. Paul's law and practice with institutional racism against So this, oh, uh, while we wait for Mr. Giles, I'll just go through this real quick. So we talk about, so that was resolution 2177. Um, and that passed seven to zero by the St. Paul City Council. And at that time, there was no black people on the St. Paul City Council. So reparations isn't a black or white issue. I would call it like a, an American issue. And then um, and then uh, so this is Dred and Harriet Scott. They were enslaved at Fort Snelling, Fort Snelling right here in the state of Minnesota. At any given time when Dred and Harry Scott were uh, enslaved, there were 20 to 30 slaves enslaved at Fort Snelling, but not. Also, so this was the U.S. military actually was incentivizing its army agents uh, to hold slaves. And they would, so the military, the U.S. military would give a stipend to uh, the army agents who held slaves at Fort Snelling. They did uh, like house cleaning, menial work, laundry, uh, things like that. Also, um, there were people who sued. So uh, a woman named Courtney, she sued, and she was actually successful with her lawsuit. And there it goes. In May of 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. Their goal was to come up with an outline for the entire government of the United States, and their biggest challenge was representation. During this time, slavery was still a major issue in the United States. In most southern states, the enslaved population made up a large percentage of the total population. Since a significant amount of their population was made up by slaves, southern states wanted their slave population to count towards their representation in the House of Representatives. The higher the population, the more representatives they would receive. 
On the other hand, the southern states took more of their enslaved population to count toward their taxes. The higher the population, the more taxes they would have to pay. The northern states disagreed with the southern states on both issues. There were fewer slave states in the north, so counting slaves and their population would not help many of the northern states gain representation. Secondly, the northern states felt that if the southern states were allowed to count slaves as part of their population for representation, they should also be counted for taxation. The solution was the three-fifths compromise. Each slave would count as three-fifths of a person for both representation and taxation purposes. Despite the fact that slaves could not vote or enjoy any of the other rights of citizenship found in the Constitution, the Three-Fifths Compromise remained in place until slavery was finally outlawed, nearly 80 years after the signing of the Constitution. But because of a court ruling in the Supreme Court dealing with Dred Scott's freedom to kind of nullify the Three-Fifths Compromise on the uh, Supreme Court at that time, which was filled with slave owner, Chief Justice Taney. I think I'm saying his name right. He was a former slave owner. He said that a person or a slave owner could take his property wherever he wanted to, even in a, in a free state. So Red, Red Scott lost that case, but he was eventually freed by a uh, person. He was His ownership was transferred to a uh, person named Mr. Blunt. Uh, this is uh, William Aiken. He was uh, a slave owner from South Carolina. Um, he was one of, he had about 878 slaves. He had the biggest rice plantation in South Carolina. But when the University of Minnesota was going through some hard times, he gave them a loan uh, to get back on their feet. At that time, the University of Minnesota was just one building. Since then, it kept expanding. But uh, Aiken was a slave owner from South Carolina who helped the university, took money that he made from the slave trade he used to help Minnesota get back on its feet. And not only was it this illegal, Ivanis Lowry is the mayor, was the mayor of St. Cloud. So he was from Kentucky. He brought slaves from Kentucky. Minnesota, and then they established what is today called St. Cloud. He also was um, a journalist. He had a, a post-slavery newspaper called The Union, and today that paper is called the St. Cloud Times. So a lot of times when we talk about oh, slavery was so long ago and things like that, a lot of the things from slavery are still the best of it, what we call them are still this is Alexander uh, Rams. He was, I think, the first governor of a, uh, Minnesota. He was appointed by, I think, President Taylor. And he said that we should exterminate the Sioux. And so here's somebody who was a lawmaker who wanted to exterminate people who were on their own land. And, um, 2008, Branson County did an anti racism policy and it said its policies and procedures harm the people that society fears the most. The people that society fears the most look like Fred Scott, in my opinion, look like George Floyd, look like Breonna Taylor, look like Amir Lott, look like um, Khalil, who was just, um, people who just, you might have seen some images of him circulating on the inter internet this past week. But those are some of the what some of the people that society fears the most look like. And according to Ramsey County, they're saying their policies and procedures are the people that society fears the most. It said the government had a hierarchy and it wasn't inclusive. So all of those thoughts, ideals, and some beliefs of Slavanus Lowry, of Alexander Ramsey. Uh, and some of the other slave owners, Aikens, who established Minnesota, established this institution, their thoughts, ideals, practice became laws and statutes and policies and, and beliefs and led up to what we have today with our racial wealth tax. In America, whites have $100 trillion worth of wealth, and Black people have about $3 trillion. Not the black people are dumb, not the black people are stupid, not the black people are lazy, but 
because of what Ramsey County said about its policies and procedures on the people that society fears the most. So in Minnesota, right now, Minnesota has the biggest racial wealth gap. Um, bigger than Mississippi, bigger than Alabama. Um, it's right here in the state of Minnesota, the third biggest after Wisconsin and Washington, D.C. And according to Demos, the racial wealth gap is substantial and driven by public policy decisions. And public policies are made by lawmakers, so people in the city, people in Congress, presidents are the ones who create public policy. Homeowners in the racial wealth gap. So, um, St. Paul, our home ownership rate, we have uh, Black Americans have about close to seven, our 17 to 16.9 percent of homeowners, and our white counterparts have about 61 to 61 percent homeowners. And generational wealth is created in home ownership. So, in Minnesota, uh, there's a good um, documentary, guys. Thank you, guys. Check out, it's called Jim Crow the Lord. It talks about racial covenants. The racial covenants were laws that say you cannot sell this house to a black person. So in Minneapolis, it's, um, they, have, they had them all over the city. They had them here in St. Paul, too. And so those, those um, laws denied black people from building generational wealth, even if they could afford to buy the property. So George Floyd um, was here in Minnesota, and I think you guys know who that is. George Floyd, George Floyd's great great grandpa was enslaved um, in North Carolina. Uh, his his land was stolen when once his great great grandfather, by the time he was eight, I think he was by the time he became 21, he had amassed about 500 acres of land. So some of the things you guys have been talking about, about food insecurity and food desert, his story is similar to a lot of Latin Americans who have lost millions of acres of land. I think since 1910 to 1997, Black Americans lost about 90% of our land. We were 14% or more of the farmers in America. Now that number is down to about one, three to one percent. The farmers. And again, land, real estate is what it do to create generational wealth in, in the United States. And uh, oh, uh, this is the last one. But the way the land was, his aunt said it was stolen from him. And because they couldn't read or write, it was hard for them to fight back uh, to secure them. <laughs> calls for an end to racial inequality are reverberating well beyond the U.S. Huge rallies in the U.K. this weekend were peaceful, apart from some violent clashes. In the city of Bristol, a statue of a slave trader was toppled. And as Crystal Demanting reports, it's calling into question who we choose to celebrate. Firestorm of reaction after protesters of all colors the statue of Edward Colston. I think that it has been um, idolized far too long in the city. I think that is utterly disgraceful. And that speaks to the acts of disorder, public disorder. Colston was a 17th century merchant who made a fortune buying, transporting, and selling people. On Sunday, people took turns rolling the bronze statue down the street, then hurled it into the harbor. Police were there, but they were stuck in. We made a very tactical decision that to stop people from doing that act may have caused further disorder, and we decided the safest piece to do in terms of our policing tactics was to allow it to take place. An official investigation has been launched, but the mayor doesn't appear to be troubled by what happened. We have thrown in the harbour that almost this piece of historical poetry where you know a man who undoubtedly had uh, slaves thrown off his ships uh, during the, the passage at some point. Ended up under water. There are several petitions calling for a statue of a prominent black figure to be erected where Tolstoy stood for 125 years. Such a political question. We let the lifting of it to move and it just seems like effortless. The Tolstoy statue will be retrieved from the water 
So the man saying global peace. And then um, I'll introduce uh, Melvin Downs, uh, one of the greatest peacemakers on earth. Please give him a round of applause. How y'all doing? My name is Melvin, and uh, real good to be here. Uh, I know Dr. Valentine worked well with her. I'm really glad that uh, Brother Cruz was able to be here today. So again, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I whispered to Valentine. I call her Valentine. Okay. Valentine, and, uh, and he just. Did you learn anything new from that? Cool. I, I did too. So that's really good. Um, you know you have a short time. You really just probably want to get into some questions. I read some of your questions you had. Uh, man, it's just really good to be in a room full of, uh, I like to think of young justice champions. And um, well, for me, I uh, some of you know me, and I want to actually step back and say thank you, Olivia. There you go for contacting me and your committee. So it's really good. Um, and she knows I like to blow bubbles. Uh, but I'm gonna blow some right now. Kind of, I've been having one of those weeks already. It's only Tuesday, and I'm, I gotta fill up. So let me see if I got some details. But I call these peace bubbles. And for me, I like bubbles. Number one is to the bullet. And I like bubbles because they soap and water. It helps to do some cleansing and it helps create space. I mean, the world we are living in. There's certain topics that are kind of hard for people to talk about. And we have to really create a space that we can get comfortable with being uncomfortable about talking about things. And part of that is letting go of guilt, letting go of shame, letting go of blame. And so the message that Brother Cruz and I and Dr. Valentine and hopefully many of you I share in these days is that it's time for a change. It's time for truth and light. Man, it's a beautiful day. Anybody see that sunrise today? It just woke me up. You know, I was trying to like, man, it was like, why cover up? You know, let the sun come in. But the days we are living in, and man, I'm so glad I'm still here on earth right now. I'm a time traveler, so I go back in time and I've been all over the place. But right now, we are living in a crucial time. In particular, more and more, I'm actually more happy that people are becoming more aware of whatever the heck climate change really means, that this is our planet. So they're doing all these great discoveries way, way out in space. We've been talking about fungi, fungi, growing on Mars these days. It's like, that's really nice, okay? How about right here? We got so much toxic stuff here, and most of the toxic stuff is our pain. And part of it is how do we start just letting go of that? And the information Brother Cruz was sharing right now, we got governors, we got mayors, we got bishops, we got preachers, we got teachers who are saying, Shh, don't share that. Sometimes they are saying, don't share it because they don't want you to feel ashamed. And it's like, man, don't be putting their stuff on you. Oh, man, we got so much work to do. And I like to think we have to do it joyfully. We have to do it cheerfully. I have a brother who uh, tells me sometime I used to wood fun a lot. And he's saying, man, you can't be telling people to have fun all the time. And I tell him, yes, you can. You can have fun kicking some butt, okay? You can have fun tearing down the system. 
especially if you do it together. So I know one of the questions that you did ask, and we're going to get back to some of this presentation, but I want to make sure I put it on the top because I'm hearing it every day. And I'm hoping that the people who are saying it don't become our so-called president. But one of the things you can do as a collective student body is start writing some letters. Or even better, man, make a video or a ticky tacky, whatever you call it. Especially since they're trying to ban that too. Man, sometimes it seems like anything good, they want to say, stop it. Do y'all recall your history in high school, junior high, about those Puritans? Even the name, pure, at 10. They wanted to ban everything. They was the ones who used to go out and kind of burn women. We call them witches. But they burned them not because that, of that, because they had knowledge. They knew about herbs. They knew how to heal. And because some man couldn't do it, they wanted to burn them. Puritan. Today, these modern day Puritans are saying, oh, don't wake up. Don't become aware that you need to not say, not talk, and not, you know, you're supposed to walk a certain way and talk a certain way. Yes. We have to see individuals as just individuals. So in particular, I'm going to ask you to start thinking about writing a letter to the governor of Floyd and any other, huh, how do you say it, any other folks who are blind who don't want to see reality. This is 2023. And they are still trying to say certain things didn't happen. Ask them, do they want to hear about how Irish became white? You know, I just talked to someone yesterday. She kind of giggled. She said, I asked her, what her how to pronounce her name. And she said, well, it's an old Polish name. It used to be spelled a certain way. But of course, they had to change it just to fit in. That's part of history. We live in a city, the Twin Cities, where just a short time, 40, well, for you, it's not a short time ago, many thousands of years ago, back in 1960, maybe 1940, but even in the 70s, there's some Jewish people who couldn't go to certain places. They couldn't play golf. They want to hide that history too. Or do they just want to hide history when, oh, anybody seen this? I don't do the Facebook, but I have seen this image, Brother Cruz, of two men kissing. And all of a sudden, these, again, these deniers, want to say, stop it, this is bad, put them in jail. However, if they see a man beating up a woman, they say, that's okay. Something is wrong with that. When people cannot express love to each other, but it's okay to do some domestic violence. Domestic violence is also what this is all about here. So again, one of the things you can do is write letters. And to write it cheerfully. Write it joyfully. Let them know who you are, that you are the future. That you are the ones who are going to be the mayor and the governor. That you're going to be the lawyers. Man, we need some doctors and we definitely need nurses. We need more first responders. And these days, we need more engineers. These folks who know how to keep these trains running without falling over, these planes in the air without. Okay. <laughs> so tell me about what you just seen. You said you learned something new. Anything that Brother Cruz and myself can share with you, but I want to hear from you. Please. Last video about pulling down the, the statue 
in the first three people they interviewed were white. First guy, white guy, we had a white woman, we had a white police officer. Then you get your first black gentleman and he's the mayor. Um, and then again, you get another black individual and you finally get a black woman. But I just thought the, the like, the priority, I guess, of who they show and when was considering the top. That's a good observation. I never pointed that out. Um, and that was in London. But that was uh, during the George Floyd uprising. This was showing that issue of slavery was global. So in, I think in the UK or in England, they ended slavery in 1805. They had to get a um, Similar to here, they took out a loan from a, one of the biggest banks over there. A slave owner for releasing their property, but they didn't pay the slave. Then what? Uh, and then they just finished. The government just finished paying off that loan, in 2015. That's why we say this is this wasn't that long ago. They just finished up. They just finished paying back that loan in our life. And. Uh, but yeah, but I do think they should have talked more people of color. I was wondering if they recognized some of the signs, like loudly, where, where have you heard those? <laughs> hey, we don't got much time. You're shaking your head, so talk to us. Come on, come on. <laughs> Anybody? Rain Ramsey County. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Whoa. I can sit down on that. Thank you. <laughs> so even uh, Fort, Fort Snelling is named after a slave owner. I go harder street, St. Paul here, that's named after a slave owner. That's in Rondo, too, man. Yeah, that's right in Wild. <laughs> so that, and that's the name that. Somebody who enslaved human beings. So a lot of this Minnesota territory, uh, Calhoun, Lake Calhoun, was a slave owner. He was one of the biggest slave owners in American history. He had about seven. Calhoun Square. Uh, Minnesota was founded by slave owners. Even though they, so they would make money from the slave trade in the South and they come travel here. Sometimes they would bring slaves with them, sometimes they would bring the money to the slave Chaka, St. Cloud, Scott County. Um, these were places that were established by slave owners with money from um, slave trade. How about Dred Scott? Anybody? Dred Scott? Please tell uh, Brother Cruz about Dred Scott. Okay. Um, well, the part that I knew was that his. Um, Ownership and the conflict over his ownership in Minnesota was also part of effectively what started the Civil War because it was the overturning of the Missouri Compromise by the Supreme Court. Um, but then I also know that there's like a Dred Scott Park in Bloomington, which I talked about with my dad. And he said he grew up playing there and never knew who Dred Scott was, which is really interesting and sad. <laughs> I, didn't <laughs> the same time. I didn't know that was there myself. Neither did I. <laughs> Did y'all hear that back there? What I heard also was sometimes I do brag about Minnesota, okay? Minnesota is the North Star. What's your name? Zoe. Zoe was just saying that really that Civil War, there was a spark because of the Dred Scott. I know for me growing up, I definitely heard of Dred Scott even in elementary school because it was associated with Minnesota. It was hard to believe. How about, uh, this wasn't in there, but how about Marshall? Anybody ever heard of a, a Supreme Court Jew named Marshall? You know, uh, what I always found interesting about him, again, it's my time traveling, okay? When he was born, I'm going to say he was born like, he was a lot older, okay? 1896. 1896. You know what else was happening about that time? 
Man, you got a good class in here. <laughs> Jim Crow became official. They started saying, oh, okay, if you people have to be around us, you can't be in chains. You need to be on the back of the train, back of the bus. That was happening when he was born. And I say, hallelujah, that about 50 years later, he, be, he was a lawyer. He started fighting. I want you to be thinking about the year you were born, what was happening. I want you to think about the year right now when kids are being born in the time you are living in. And do we have to wait 50, 60, 70 years to change stuff? You know what? Excuse me, teacher. Close your ears. I like saying the word shit sometimes, okay? <laughs> Man. Oh, boy. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the questions are, how would you define reparations to someone who might not know what it means? Well, reparations is not charity. Reparations is a debt for Jim Crow, slavery, the lynching period. Mass incarceration, uh, what we just talked about, we talked about redlining and redistricting, and uh, even up to the day when we talk about the uh, George Floyd era, and how does your identity impact affected all reparations? Uh, my dad, on my dad's side, uh, he's a Scott, I don't know if he's been connected to Red Scott, but um, now it comes from a plantation in, in Mississippi. Also, my mom is from the historic Wando community here. Our um, house, my uncle Davis, great, great uncle Davis. This house was one of the last houses on Wando. He was kind of blind, so they, the sheriff would come by and try to get him to come out the house, but he would always come out with a shot. Be careful. So they tricked him, they got him to come outside, and then they kind of get him in handcuffs, and they took the family out able to uh, take down take down the house. So those are kind of my um my identity as far as reparations. Then how has your work contributed to reparations? I mean, we started it out like that when we talked about like the city of St. Paul. Basically when George Floyd happened, COVID-19 happened, that's how we um, encouraged the city of St. Paul to pass resolution 2177 and the St. Paul recovery act. And what we you guys can do today he was talking about calling our governor because Minnesota has the biggest racial wealth gap in the country. And one of the good things is Minnesota has a $20 billion surplus, one of the biggest surplus in the country. We think that that money should be used to address the racial wealth gap in Minnesota. We shouldn't be proud that we have a racial wealth gap. That should be something that every lawmaker should focus on. So this bill is $20 Seven. It's called the Minnesota Migration Act. You can call your governor, call your senator, call your legislature, tell them you want to hear about this, you want to see this pass. This year we have one time funding that, that can be used to start addressing the racial wealth gap. Um, so, yeah, um, this is something that we can do today. And this called the Minnesota Migration Act because a lot of Black Americans migrated from. South. I know you guys heard of the Great Migration. So we migrated from the south to the north to find a better life, but still found what we have today is the biggest race of wealth gap, uh, what happened to George Floyd. You know, so we still found white supremacy and institutional racism. So we think the Minnesota Migration Act is the best way to start addressing that. And that's something that you guys can do today, or even right now in the computer. So we can get it passed. It's uh, House Resolution. This is Resolution 2177, uh, but that was passed into law January 5th. And now St. Paul is one of the arsons. It's a permanent reparation ordinance for the city of St. Paul. And then this is the state level work. So a lot of people in Minneapolis or other places like say, well, what about Minneapolis? <laughs> you guys, you know, you know, I'm not a Minneapolis resident, so I don't think it's part of uh, reparation push in Minneapolis, so we just went to the state doing statewide work. Uh, and we were in St. Cloud, Rochester, Minneapolis. Uh, it also addresses the Duluth lynching. 
and addresses what mm-hmm. happens in um, this also calls for anti modern day anti lynching legislation because of what we've been seeing with uh, Khalil Azad, Harry Nichols, and other people like that. But yeah, this is something that you can do uh, right away. Let me hear it. Anytime I hear that word lynching, uh, I mean, th- too many things go in my mind. Uh, I know that when you start your class today, it's something, I'm not sure how you did it, but you did a land acknowledgement. So I'm sure that folks in this room know about the largest collective lynch. When I think of that. You know, I think of, uh, man, this is really big. The work that needs to be done. You know, we are talking about little old Rondo. Uh, but First Nation people, you know, I used to live in South Dakota for a while. And people would tell me, oh, man, we give these Indians all these treaties, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you, know, you never keep them. But... Somehow we have to find this balance to how we, because part of uh, what keeps us in toxic situations is trying to divide us constantly. And we have to somehow learn how to know that what's good for me is good for you. What's good for you is good for her. That's hard. Again, when I think of time, you know, Dr. King, he died in 1968, and immediately people started talking about a holiday. Oh, man. Again, it took 20, 30, 40 years. Now we walk around like, oh, King Holiday. You know, like it's no big deal. People had to fight. There's reparations. There was a brother. Who's the brother? Randolph? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, Philip Randolph. Yeah. Back in like 49, he wanted to have that type of I have a dream speech. That took another 20 years to really make it happen. And there was another Randolph who started writing on the national level about reparation. That was in the 70s. And so it has taken us this much time just to come down. I'm sure and I have to say again, Something else you can be doing. I think you are doing it already. But at Hamlin University, you can start your own type of reparation. I told Valentine about my best buddy in high school who ended up going to Hamlin University. He now was at, for a moment, vice assistant principal at um, Obama School, the old Web, F. Webster. But his time here at Hamlin was suffering, was struggling. But I also know Hamlin University has a good history, particularly with the Methodist women. Man, they was abolition. There are things we can each do. I want to ask you guys to tell me what your definition is of reparation. Because uh, the best one I heard was from, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Curtis, white dude, preacher. Uh, he runs now the Minnesota Church Council. Curtis D. Young? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he used to teach over at Bethel University. He wrote a book called Reconciliation. And in this book, he sh- shares a story about this Indian dude who had a nice little ride, you know. One day somebody stole it. But then about 25 years later, the guy who stole it, a woman, came up to him and said, hey, stole the car. So I just want to apologize. And the Indian dude said, well, that's good. Where is it? And the person said, well, I, I said, I'm sorry. And he said, well, that's good, but where's my car? For me, that's when it really hit me what reparations is. It's like, man, I'm sick of these apologies. I'm glad 
Then it took over 300 years for somebody to finally say, oh, we're sorry for our flavor. We're sorry for taking your land. We said, whoa. It's like, well, what are you sorry for? Where's the action of saying you are sorry? So let me ask if you can do it briefly. I'll, I'm going to walk by the table. One person at least from the table. Give me a definition. Your definition. Your definition. How would you define it? This is going to help Brother Cruz and myself when we go out and talk to people. And there's different ways of sharing. So I don't want to look at the Bible. Go to this table, please. I guess like, I would define it as action, but kind of like what you said. And I think it could start as like something small. Like, don't know people who we can engage with and it doesn't have to be like if you can wear your food, like if you're joining like a big like, group movement, you can do that. But if it's something like with your friend or your neighbor or like a classmate or someone you know personally, like it can start there too. Y'all did hear that, right? It don't have to be me. California gonna tell you that right now. It's no. Start off small. Okay, man. I don't have to be focused, but come on, you gotta do it. Come on, come on, that. Come on, you can join the table, right? I guess it's like But also building structures. Never thought of it. I think it's that for both that. Right. <laughs> All right, okay, it has to matter. Hello, okay, give me that. Yeah, that's the okay. same. I'm going to trick that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Who's going to do it? I would say, like, access to knowledge. Knowledge is always kind of the most important thing. People that want to marginalize others will, like, take away that knowledge, especially when it comes to, like, book learning. And, like, um, I wrote a paper on the Tulsa Race Massacre. Oh! Yeah, um, and how they, um, yeah, so how they didn't end up lynching anyone, but he, there was, like, a threat of one, and they ended up, like, completely burning down an entire, like, thriving Black community to take away, like, their power, or not their power, but, like, their lives, and all of them ended up homeless and died, and that's kind of how they, like, took that away from that. Oh, you see it in like groups like Al Qaeda and the Nazi regime as well over time. So, thank you. Knowledge is power. And this, you, you raise your hand, but we're going to get to this table. That Tulsa, you know, I'm sure anybody's familiar with that. This past Sunday, man, I think up the day, you know, they'd be having this thing late night called African American Short Story. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They just had one on concrete ma mansion. It was about to cost. And for me, it just really hit me again because they had some photos. That whole saucer thing, if you can believe it, it was the first time they did domestic the cranes and put, throwing bombs. 
It's like, man, where did these bombs come from in 1921 that they're going to blow up black community? That's crazy. Thank you. Okay, you got purple art, so this is the best table in the room. Right. Um, I would say that reparations is, I mean, a lot of times it's focusing on like diversity, but like the other part of it, diversity is equity and inclusion. So okay. also like setting equity and inclusion with how reparations are here. Oh man, it's so hard to do. But that is, I hope you all heard that. We have to get even used to just hearing those words. Oh, it takes a while. Good smile, good table. Oh, man, this is getting too powerful. Okay, we got two more tables. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, taking ownership. Ah, not blaming. You no, know, as a young black man, as an old black man. I have to take ownership. As far as right when I get stopped by a cop, do I blame the cop for stopping me? Or do I first check myself, you know, am I uh, reading? Do I got my lights on, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or am I constantly, just because I see them, I'm going to just start assuming they're going to stop. Me. Do I take ownership and say, hey, I'm not doing boo boo. I'm just driving. Oh, I'm just walking. I'm just riding my bike. Taking ownership in different ways. Being an ally. That's very, very powerful. Okay. I, can't, I did see a hand up over here. You probably was just stretched. You no, know, but how about this table? Okay. So thank you. <clears throat> so this is related to knowledge. And I know, and I know that you said something about reparations being that, but I think another part that could, another part to reparations is to actually deconstruct, deconstruct any of the, any of the misinformation and revisionist history that's been going around and any other stuff, any other stuff that keeps it down. Because if you want to build something up, sometimes there'll be things in the way, things in the way that'll hinder it or prevent it from happening. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and I and I am very aware of it. I I look it up frequently to see which stuff is like which stuff is like really wrong. Like they'll do videos where they talk about how historical figures, oh, they were they weren't actually that bad, or they were fine with the system. They liked the system, and we need to. We need to Thank you. That, that's, Powerful. We got one more table, and then I'm gonna let you loose, man. No, uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, uh, that gift they gave us, or even more better, the Washington Monument. This is my little Washington Monument. Okay, this is my actually my. I'm traveling peace and all my alchemy. <laughs> But the Washington Monument, you know, they start building that, right? Then they had to put a pause on it for a long, long time. Then it came back to it. They had to put a pause to it. They had to keep on destructing, but deconstructing how to finish that. Some things take time. And one of the things that we have to de deconstruct, and I'm going to say this to all the men in the room, because this table is all, well, for my eyes, okay? Uh, just like racism to sexism. And the young man just said, we don't understand some things sometimes. As a man, I have to a lot to learn about feminine. But more so, how do I deconstruct my male chauvinist mind? How do I become a 
recovering dopamine. This says white people are learning how to become a recovering racist. Even if you have done nothing, even if you're the best man in the whole world, it's by the way we've all been educated and taught in our certain gender roles, in our certain racial roles, and that those who have the power have to learn to let go of that power. And sometimes, and most times, we don't even know what the power we have. In particular, when it comes to race. Because most of that power was gained years ago. Hundreds of years ago. And the farmer over there in Scott County got his farm. Because he could just pay $20 because he was white, but more so because a First Nation person, a Black person, a Mexican couldn't even have the opportunity. Or, as I was saying, or a woman didn't have the opportunity. So, the wise table, the wisdom table, the balance table. Reparation, what is the balance table? Oh man, give yourself a hand. That was really good. Yeah, that's uh, and just a lot. Every pretty much every answer that we heard is correct. And so the um, the United Nations and internationals are international standards for rep reparations. Uh, um, one is guarantees of non repetition. So non repetition means that Black Americans won't beat up by the police. So we just seen what happened to George Floyd, but then after what happened to George Floyd, we see what happened to Amir Lot. We just seen what happened to uh, Khalil that was found in the lake. We just seen what happened to Tyree Nixon. So guarantees of non-repetition would mean that that doesn't continue to happen. I'm Number sorry, two, tell them what happened. Maybe they know about this. Uh, Khalil was, uh, I think, a, okay, he was um, pulled over and then ran from the police and then he was found dead in the lake. Um, the, they took his body out the lake and he looked really, you can see all the damages and stuff on. He looks like a modern day Emmett Till. So we've been, um, our organization actually, the family contacted us and then we just wrote an article about it and it went viral for the whole week. The press wasn't, well, it's happening in June, but the family's been a lot. And that family been reaching out since then, and there's been no press cover coverage of it until recently. And uh, that was just from grassroots organizing too. So that uh, that's an ongoing situation that that we're going to be dealing with for for a while here. But that's guarantees of non-repetition. Um, also, non-repetition means it won't be housing. Uh, Chief former chief of police Axel said, "Black motorists are." Pulled over four times more likely than our white counterparts. So as this starts to be implemented, that that should not be the case. Um, there shouldn't be more housing discrimination, employment discrimination, things that healthcare disparities, health health discrimination. So that's guarantees of non-repetition. Then there's restitution. You know what you guys were talking about with restitution. Part of restitution is education. So learning where you come from, but also being able to learn about reparations, to learn about what we just talked about today. We talked about Slovenia style. We talked about the other history of Alexander Ramsey and some of the critical race theory. What we just some people call it critical race theory. Some people just call it actual history. Um, another one is rehabilitation because of how people are beaten, um, trauma. The trauma that comes with the daily toll of racism has health impacts on, on Black Americans. Um, so 
socially, politically, economically. Minnesota has some of the biggest health disparities um, in, in the country. So rehabilitation is another component of, of rep reparations. Compensation, so when we talk about $20 billion surplus that Minnesota has, we have the biggest racial wealth gap. A compensation would be another form of reparation. And then also, the last one is satisfaction. Like, okay, this is when we come together, reparations has happened. I feel like I've been compensated. Um, so the, the people who are aggrieved feel like um, that everything is cool and we're back on people's feet. Footing, when people have been restored to the, to, the, to the place that they were previously before the injury for the harm. So those are the five principles of reparation. This by international standard and pretty much what everybody said would fall under some, some of those categories. You guys are right on point with um, reparations movement in the United States and internationally. And, and um, I think, so you can take some of this information. You can go to the SaintPaulRecoveryAct.com. There's a survey on here. Go to SaintPaulRecoveryAct.com, click on survey, and it's a good way to start the conversation with family and friends. And just take the survey. Sometimes I try to have people do it. If you might stop at a question, just be on that question for like an hour. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, this has been a great experience talking to you guys. If we have time, we, can we get a picture, a group picture before you guys are? We, before we do, we have about 10 minutes. Oh, so um, I'd love a group picture. It would also be great to tell us a little bit more about what, I know I know. when we come back from spring break, we're gonna have another conversation about how we move forward with us. Mm -hmm. But we'd love to know a little bit about like what is happening with St. Paul right now. So given, even especially the St. Paul, because we're here, what does the passing of that act mean? Like, what gets to happen? So now, right now, for those, all of you, who, especially if you live in St. Paul, the application, the St. Paul Preparation Commission, are open until March 24th. Uh, you can go to stpaul.gov slash reparation to fill that application out. If you're interested in on the commission, share it with your friends and then there was also, I think that closed, but they're hiring somebody to help uh, manage the project. And uh, so that's really exciting that, you know, the applications are available right now. So if people who are interested in serving on the commission, you can go sign up. There, yeah, there it is right there. Wow. And uh, yes, <laughs> this is a really, um, I mean, and this is just something, it's just really exciting to see this because we started working on it like three years ago. We started working on it three years ago. Us, bro. our ancestors have been working on this since uh, General Abraham Lincoln, you know, and seeing it come starting to uh, take traction and become reality uh, in our lifetime is really incredible. So when I'm looking at that, sometimes I'm against myself. But it's uh, even more important. All of us in this room is part of this. Exactly. We are all part of this. And you mentioned the TASA study that you did, you know, the report. You all can do something similar. Man, if you can get credit for it, that's pretty good too. <laughs> but to check out other cities, every place in America right now, a big city, even if they don't have any black folks are trying to say, how can we do this? In the last uh, decade, the world population has grown so much. Can you imagine if we would have took care of this stuff 100 years ago? Even if we would have took care of this 50 years ago. If we would took care of this 50 years ago, man, you wouldn't even know what we're talking about right now. It would just be natural again. But the longer we keep putting this off, the more it gets complicated. It means more people, and that means more calculation, particularly with that whole compensation. And I don't know if we got any mathematicians in here, or business people, 
But we all need to start getting creative about the word reparation and how we do that compensation. You know, I love hearing the stories about these farmers, particularly more in the South, but I'm hearing more and more in the Midwest, who are realizing that, oh, great great grandpa got this land free and got it from those people. So they are gifting it back to people, or gifting it back to farmers or to, to a collaborative. Dr. Valentine, in her spare time, I don't know how she does it. She has a, and I'm sure she have, will be speaking to you about it, but helping farmers, particular farmers of color, not just be able to farm once a man, but to own it. And sometimes own it collectively. That's a beautiful way, I think, of reparations. No, even think of a creative word. Man, throw the word reparations out the window. Somebody just said being fair is about just being fair. You know, it's getting like that Indian dude, where's my car? You no, know, even if it's 20 or 100 or 300 years old, where is it? I loved it. You know, man, it is. Whoa, wow. Ow! Yes. I know Valentine want to hear some of this. I want to hear more from you. Hello. Oh, hi. I was yes. sleeping. I wasn't really. Being in the seat, except waggle this time around. <laughs> Sorry. Well, give, give, a, give a good, whatever, throw out a good question for, again, to hear. Brother Cruz and myself learn. Question is how do we go from really hard and more support, and also there's a lot of badness and I think with that point that you made earlier about some people like, and I'm just wondering if that might not be so easy for everybody to do. That's a part of the question. I also like, especially at that moment when the resource is available, our elbows are still How do we keep joy in the bureaucratic process of actually repairing things? I think um, it's hard. I think this is a wonderful thing that we're able to be a part of that we're um, that we're having these hard conversations and that St. Paul decided to say, hey, you know, well, we're going to do something about leadership and the restoration of that. Um, that you know, it's 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 hard conversations, but St. Paul is actually doing something about that, and that's a really joyful thing. Justice is a is a is a good thing. It's, sometimes it's that you're going to have tough conversations, tough things that you're going to have to address. When people start getting justice, socially, politically, and economically, that's one of the most joyful things on our planet. Um, so I know it's a lot. There's, there's some of that real tough to digest, but then to know that we have young, brilliant minds in here that are coming up and that are going to address racial inequality, you guys are going to be our future leaders, and to know that you're not just coming into the workforce, going into your careers, blindly not knowing uh, the truth, is, is to me is a jo very joyful thing. So I'm, I'm really excited that uh, just to be here to have this conversation, just from some of you guys' response, responses uh, about the question he asked, that brings a lot of joy. So I'm um, excited about the future. Thank you. Yeah. Not to embarrass you, uh, Jesse is the baby face come out and he was saying, boy in America. But not to embarrass you, when I met this young man, he was mad as hell. He's still mad as hell. But he's mad as hell. That is heck, <laughs> with, a, with a smile. You know, when I think of that question, I'm, I, my mind constantly goes one place. So I'm gonna ask you kind of to reimagine maybe the first time you tasted a strawberry or tasted pineapple. For me, my mind's go back to this little kid, three years old, his 
first fight. I know that strawberry. He bit the strawberry. Ah! He spin around. And I remember watching this kid and I said, man, I want that in my life forever. I want to remember of something new and exciting. And what Brother Cruz just said about it is so joyful when truth can come out. That little innocence of this kid. I'm just so happy you wouldn't take the bite of cilantro. <laughs> I do not like it. Okay? I don't even like looking at that cilantro. But the strawberry, so when I think of joy, oh boy, now I'm feeling depressed, actually. I try to remember that little kid. And I try to remember that each of us, we used to have a partner, Mrs. Given. Call her the godmother of Pete. Yeah. She was older than me. But I used to always have to remind her that she used to be a kid. Yeah, you right now, you know, you almost the prime of your life. But hopefully you're going to keep growing and growing. Decades, decades. But you would keep that child within you. I'm going to say that innocence. So that innocence is the truth. But the truth is like, man, we are here on this planet just to skip and to enjoy this. Oh, man, some of us really do believe that we started in a garden. Oh, eating naturally. Dr. Valentine's giving me that look. I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> I was just thinking about the cilantro yes. in the garden. That's all. Uh, okay. But <laughs> right, look at the clock, so I will too. Do you have any questions or comments for us or things you want Brother Cruz to share at the city level? Because he's inside that city level. People need to keep us, and this so wonderful. And I would love to respect your request for photos. So while we have time, we're going to come down to this end, front of this website that is real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Photoshop you and me into bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one doesn't make a noise, but I just got a few. Oh, wait, wait, I'm gonna get that bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> 